Okay, good afternoon everybody. Um, after a slight delay, I'd like to welcome you all to the latest Lonely Planet Hangout on Air. Um, this week we're talking about Lonely Planet's Best in Travel 2015 and in particular our 10 countries list. Um, gathered together to discuss that list, which we'll go into more detail on very shortly, um, is a very eminent panel of experts on these destinations around the world who themselves are in various places around the world. So we have a very international group here. Um, we've got Tony Wheeler, the co-founder of Lonely Planet, and Lonely Planet writers Anna Kaminsky, Paul Klammer, Sean Lowe, and Rory Goulding. I'm Tom Hall. I'm the um, editorial director here at Lonely Planet, and um, it's my great pleasure to ask the first question about the top destination, the top country for 2015, which is Singapore. Very few people know Singapore as well as Sean Lowe, who is punching the air as I say the <laughs> word Singapore. Um, Sean, tell us then, fill, fill us in, what, why does Singapore deserve its status as the number one destination, do you think? All right, so I'll start with the caveat. I, I'm, I'm born in Singapore, so no bias there, clearly. But uh, <laughs> Singapore... Singapore's great. Uh, it's it's celebrating its 50th uh, anniversary, Golden Jubilee of uh, independence as a country since it uh, split from the British, and sort of everything seems to have been building up to this big thing next year. You know, infrastructures up, the new train lines. There's a lot of uh, new spanking new buildings, uh, Gardens by the Bay, Marina Bay Sands, very iconic buildings that have come up in a short space of time. But also, more importantly, I think there's just so much buzz in the undercurrent. There's a lot of sports events, uh, Formula One, WTA, women's tennis. The National Art Gallery is opening next year. So much is happening. And I think it culminates in one big party next year. It's the SG50 party. So if you go to Singapore next year, look out for all these events that will happen throughout the calendar year. So the government's just putting up uh, lots of events like uh, performances, exhibitions and uh, keep your eyes peeled for it. So I think there's a lot of appeal, food, uh, shopping, everything. Singapore is just one big party next year. One big party and indeed, as far as I know, home to the world's only airport with an open air swimming pool where you can watch planes being loaded as you yourself have a nice refreshing dip. Um, I want to open Singapore up um, to the panel in a minute just in case anyone has any comments on it but Sean just before we, I do that um, it does have a reputation for being one of the world's most expensive cities to live in um, how can visitors get the best out of it on a budget Singapore uh, well they, they should start by reading Lonely Planet's article there's, a, there's an article 23 things you can do in Singapore and that's a good list to start but there Singapore's this you know, there's two extremes. You can eat really cheaply. Hawker centers are a great place to sample the local food. Things will only cost you $3 uh, for a meal. And that's a great place to start. Uh, lots of stuff is free, you know. Uh, admission to uh, art galleries are free. Uh, there, there are ways to get cheap accommodation as well if you look at hostels, Airbnb, and, and, and if you get creative and looking for where to stay, couch surfing, you name it. So that's that's a way to balance a budget. Um, does it, thank you, Sean. Um, does any, anybody else have anything they'd like to add about Singapore? Um, you know, anybody been there recently, or have a particular tip, or something special to do there? Anna, you were just there, right? Well, I, I was there a few weeks ago, um, and I have to say, for me, Singapore is special because I, well, I've slept on a lot of airport floors throughout my <laughs> lifetime, and I have to say that the Changi airport floor is the most comfortable I've ever slept on. <laughs> so, top marks. A, a very comfortable floor, um, as, well, as well as a swimming pool, an, an essential criteria. It's carpeted, you see. So. Yeah. <laughs> Um, right, we're going to move on from Singapore. There, there are 10 destinations in the list, and I want to try and cover as many of them as we can. And um, I'd, I'd like to turn to, to Tony Wheeler, if I may. Tony, um, Namibia and the Republic of Congo form a very strong African presence in this year's list of top 10 countries. Um, I know you've, you've, been, uh, you've been to both those places. Um, do you feel that Namibia makes for a good introduction to African travel? Yeah, I think Namibia is one of the the easier countries in Africa. It's it, it's not um, it's not one of the really 
the difficult ones, and there are some difficult places in Africa. And it's got it's got the wildlife. I, I was the last time I was there. I was in the Atosha National Park, which has got every sort of African wildlife that you expect to find. Lots of giraffes in particular. I remember coming out of the room of the place I was staying in one morning and looking up and looking straight into the eyes of a giraffe who was looking looking down at me. As giraffes tend to do. Usually a giraffe is looking down at you rather than rather than eye to eye or up. And that, that was a good start to the experience there. But also of course the coast and the sand dunes and the that 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 side of it is certainly part of Namibia. I, uh, I I cycled through quite a lot of Namibia a few years ago, and the thing that stuck in my mind was this, the feeling of space that that you had there. Um, you know, it, it felt like that that there was you know not that many people around, and then you got to Windhoek, which is actually quite a lively capital city. Um, very interesting place. A, a, another eye-catching destination is that is the Republic of Congo on the list. Um, how do you even go about going to the Republic of Congo, Tony? Well, you, you fly straight to Brazzaville. Brazzaville is, uh, what's fun is that? <laughs> no problem. Um, Brazzaville is the, the capital, and it, it, it's the nearest capital to another capital because you can look across the river from Brazzaville and see Kinshasa, the, the capital of the, the bigger, darker Congo, the Congo Democratic Republic. But there are regular flights to Brazzaville, so you know, jump on a plane and fly there. So it, it's it's not the easiest place to to travel to overland. You know, I've I've crossed the river back and forth between Brazzaville and Kinshasa, but going going south, going down to Angola, or coming in from the north, is not so easy. The descriptions that I've heard of that ferry journey make it make it sound like quite a, um, a, a an intense experience. It it hundred percent is an intense experience. Uh, you know, it, it's complete chaos, and you're not really sure what's happening. And you you basically just got to throw yourself on the, the mercy of officials and fixers. There's always a fixer there who, for a small payment, unfortunately not too large a payment, will will sort things out. But I I must admit, both directions from Kinshasa to Brazzaville, and then Brazzaville back to Kinshasa. Half the time, I wasn't really sure what was happening at all. I was busting in the gods to get me across that river. <laughs> and and the, the last thing about Congo is um, it, uh, this this enormous figure for the population of lowland gorillas living there. A hundred thousand estimated population of lowland gorillas. Uh, I mean, you know, that is an amazing number. Um, you know, just I, I wonder if it's true. I I really because gorilla, gorillas need a lot of space. You know, you don't. You don't pack them in. Uh, they they need territory to roam. And I've, I've seen gorillas um, not in the um, Congo Republic. I have seen them in the Democratic Republic, and I've also seen them in the Central African Republic. And both times, you, you know, there was a a lot of jungle and not much gorilla in it. So the idea there's a hundred thousand gorillas, great idea, but I'm not hundred percent certain that it's true. Well, yes, it would be a fantastic thing to go and find out, certainly. Um, okay, I, I stay, staying with Africa, but a, a very different slice of Africa. Um, Morocco is, uh, is, on, is on our list. Morocco is uh, number 10 on the list of top 10 countries. And uh, Paul Klammer, you know Morocco probably better than, better than most people in the world. Um, many travellers will be familiar with, with Marrakesh, or certainly with the, the image of, of Marrakesh. Um, is the, is the image of Marrakesh the reality of it? And also, where else should be on travellers' lists for Morocco? Tom, I, I'm glad uh, you, we've, we've sort of got to the other African bit, the other end of the continent. Um, Tony's talking about these two fantastic wildlife destinations, um, and I always think of Morocco as, as basically, it's, it's Africa, it doesn't have what, the wildlife, but it has absolutely everything else. Um, Marrakesh of course, this ancient trading city, but um, and it does live up to to its reputation. I mean, it's a place where you, the the main square, the Jemarov Now, you can see storytellers and snake charmers, and it, it really is a little like something from the Arabian Nights. But if you go beyond that, you have sort of the even more ancient city of Fez, with sort of this tremendous winding Medina. But of course, Morocco, you have a series of these fabulous mountain ranges: the Rift Mountains, the Middle the the, the Middle Atlas, the High Atlas. Um, and when you go down to the deep south, you, you've got the edge of the Sahara Desert, so you can go on camel safaris as well. So it's, it's an incredibly diverse country. 
Um, and and I, I think that, um, you know, particularly over the last few years, as, as maybe people have switched their gaze from Marrakesh, it's still a very, very popular place, um, Fez has been suggested as, a, as an alternative destination. Maybe if you've been to Marrakesh and want to see somewhere else, if, if we're talking about that, would that be your recommendation, or is there somewhere else that, that you would go to? I'm I'm a little bit biased because I tend to spend about half of the year living in Fez, um, so I naturally think it's a, a rather wonderful city. It's um, it, it's a little bit more. It's about maybe how Marrakesh was maybe 20 years ago. Um, there are a lot of nice sort of the Riyadh guest houses that everyone knows that that still exists, but it's still very much a sort of a working city. So you'll still see. Um, We've lost Paul, have we? We've lost Paul. Can you hear me? Am I, am I back? I keep going. Sorry, we lost Yeah, sorry. I think that possibly the internet connection in my end. Um, it's still very much a working city, so all of the fantastic handicrafts uh, that Morocco is famous for, you can you can go and visit the artisans and, and see these things being made, the silks, the, the woodwork, the the, uh, the leather work particularly. So it's, it's a really, really magical place. And But just within sort of a few hours of, um, of being in outside Fez, you can be on the Atlantic coast or you can be up trekking in the Middle Atlas um, you know, amongst the sort of the oak forests, which are which are full of monkeys, not as not as good as Lola gorillas, but but monkeys nonetheless. Um, right, we're going to go to sort of take a, a, a transatlantic hop from uh, from Morocco to the Caribbean, um, and while spending time uh, on a on the on the beach in St. Lucia, we gather Rory Gould it more of the island. So, Rory, to to me, St. Lucia sounds a bit like the classic fly and flop Caribbean island, and um, what, what's there for independent travellers? What's there for curious travellers to see and do? Well, the uh, the main resort area in, in St. Lucia is really only, it's about 5% of the total. It's kind of up, up in the north near Rodney Bay, and the rest of the island is is very mountainous, kind of jungle-covered, and um, the, the the most, uh, the standout thing to see, and, and in fact do, there are the, uh, the pitons, which are these two, uh, volcanic cones, uh, the remains of this 10,000-year-old volcano on the west coast, and there's there's two of them, and uh, I think they're in the in the region of sort of 750 meters uh, high, and you can uh, they're a World Heritage site, and um, I uh, climbed up the uh, Gropito, which is the uh, the tour of the two, and it's 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 quite um I think anybody who's who's got uh, kind of Decent level of fitness uh, can do it. It's not kind of technically a difficult climb, but it is quite quite tiring. But from the top, you you see a view all the way along the uh, the west coast, and it's it's uh, it's beautiful. And um, it's um, it's just you know part part of this uh, very kind of volcanically formed island, and the center of it is um, quite inaccessible. There's no kind of roads going through the middle, but what there is is um, lots of uh, you know, rainforest, uh, wildlife, uh, kind of endemic birds and uh, plants, and you can do uh, nature tours and, and zip line tours of, uh, of this island. And, and of course, the, uh, the, the Piton uh, National, uh, the Piton World Heritage, World Heritage Site area kind of goes into the, uh, the sea as well, where there's uh, snorkeling and um, scuba diving all around. Is it is um is St Lucia um, an affordable destination? I mean, is is it somewhere that you need to be staying in a in a large resort to get I, the most of? I don't think so. I mean, I, you, if you obviously you want to be right on the beach, there's going to be the the premium there. But um, you can find you know, guest houses all around the island and um, on the the east coast, for example, because it's the Atlantic facing coast. It's not it's not sort of um, the kind of calm sea, so it's not really bathing beach territory. But if you know you're around there, it's going to be a lot, a lot quieter. Well, and and you know the, the the restaurants aren't, aren't the food isn't pricey at all. Right. Outside the <laughs> you know outside the resorts. Thank you, Rory. Uh, it's an interesting overview of St. Lucia, which I, I must confess is somewhere that I knew very little about before I, w I was reading about it in Best in Travel this year. Um, somewhere that I think um, certainly. I know a little bit better, maybe other people, by the reaction that this suggestion has got amongst our community, um, is Lithuania. Um, Lithuania is our, is our third top, uh, number three in our list of top ten countries to visit this year. Um, Anna, I know you know um, you know Lithuania very well. Um, 
the, one of the principal reasons that it's included in Best in Travel 2015 is that it's entering the euro or it's adopting the euro as its currency next year. Um, when this has happened in, in other countries, prices have, have gone up um, and Lithuania is, is famously affordable. Should we be worried about it going into the euro for this reason or do you think we can be relaxed about that? Well, I wouldn't be overly worried because if you look at the examples of its neighbours, um, Estonia, which joined the Euro a couple of years before, and uh, Latvia, which joined the Euro this year, um, the prices have gone up a little bit, but uh, but not uh, uh, not hugely so. So, I mean, if, for example, at the moment in Lithuania you'd be paying um, $60 a night for a hotel room, you might be paying 65 when they switch to the euro. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't let it put you off from going there. I think it will still stay pretty affordable. Okay, well, well that's good and, and uh, it's good that it's likely to stay affordable because I think lots of people have been saying what a special place they find it. Um, I, I'd, I'd back that, I've got my own views on this one, but, but what, what do you think makes Lithuania so special? What, what marks it out? Well, I have a soft spot for it because basically as somebody born in the Soviet Union, uh, the west of Lithuania, all forests and lakes and everything, it was a very uh, affordable place to go on holiday for ordinary Soviet families like mine. Uh, but having travelled around Lithuania as an adult, what I love about it is the uh, the large collection of offbeat attractions. So for example, in the south of the country you have Gruto Parkas, which is uh, a kind of a collection of all the Soviet statues that this one guy bought up and there's a kind of a concentration camp vibe about it. He put a, a, a barbed wire fence around the whole thing and you have Soviet music blaring from the loudspeakers and all sorts of Soviet memorabilia um, and that's kind of, uh, the Soviet kitsch is quite fun. Um, a more sobering memorial is the Hill of Crosses near the town of Shaulai, which is towards the northern border of Lithuania. Uh, people have been putting planting crosses there since uh, a, a defeat uh, by Russia in the 19th century. And um, the Soviets discouraged this practice, but people still risk their lives to go and plant crosses there. So you have these two hillocks with giant crosses and little crosses dangling off them. And if you go there and you're there all by yourself and there's you know, the wind whistling through the whole thing, it's, it's quite an eerie spectacle. Um, and I don't know if my colleagues get asked a question which I consider particularly annoying. Um, but basically, I, I get asked a lot, what's my favorite place in the world? Because it's an impossible question to answer. But I would say that the Coronian Spit, uh, the Lithuanian section of it, which is basically a, th a thin sliver of land in the Baltic Sea, just off the west coast of Lithuania, is one of my favorite places on Earth. Um, it's basically this, this uh, thin sliver of land that's densely forested. And um, it has sleepy little fishing villages there and, and enormous sand dunes, which look more which will look really out of place. It's like something out of the Sakara Desert. Um, and you just cycle through the forest and if you're lucky you'll spot some wildlife and you go berry picking. And again, this harks back to my Soviet childhood. Um, and then of course you have Vilnius capital with this Baroque architecture and, um, and a surprisingly diverse dining scene. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Lithuanian cuisine, but the, the national dish, the zeppelin, is basically uh, a crime against the potato. It's a kind of a uh, rugby ball of potato dough, and you dig through all this potato dough to get to the spam inside, and you're deeply disappointed. Um, but in Vilnius, you can find genuine Mexican food, genuine Indian food, and it's, it's a very, it's, you know, it's a beautiful cosmopolitan city with cobbled streets, and I would say probably the most beautiful of all the three Baltic capitals. Um, so yes, for me, Lithuania is very special. I, uh, I'm glad that there are Mexican and other international restaurants when the alternative is a crime against the potato to eat. Uh, yeah, <laughs> a lovely way to describe it. Um, I'm going to come back to a couple of other destinations, but we do have some questions from um, some of our fans and followers. Um, I wonder, Tony, can I ask you, um, you know, coming up with it with a top 10 list of, of destinations is um, a bit of a challenge, it's an interesting one. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on the, on the positive and possibly negative impact of doing a top 10 list on the, on the particular destinations? 
I, I think that a, a lot of countries really get a kick out of out of being on that list. I've, I've so often been somewhere where I, was, I remember I was in Ireland a few years ago and well, it wasn't a country but a, a, one of the towns in Ireland got on the list and suddenly all this attention was was focused on it. Taiwan, when I think Taiwan was on the list a few years ago and there were trams running around Melbourne where I am now in Australia with you know visit Taiwan because Lonely Planet says it's good down the side. It, it's it's a it's a good thing. I think it's you know we we have ten every year. Well, we could run through every country on Earth in twenty years or so, couldn't we? <laughs> That's right. It's a good point. Um, what you just mentioned Ireland, and, and I I did want to talk. Unfortunately, Fionn Davenport is isn't able to join us, but I think that um, you know between us we can probably cover Ireland off. Okay, Tony, I I think you. You authored the first Lonely Planet Ireland guide a few years ago. Um, yeah, I, and, and I did it sort of twice because I, I did the Western Europe guide, which had a an Ireland chapter, and then I came back when we did the Ireland guide, working with an Irish author. So there were two of us working on it, and hey, it's a great country to travel around. It really is. I think you know, it's got great walking, it's got great cycling, as long as it isn't raining on you. And even you know, driving around, public transport isn't always the best. It can take a long time to get from place to place by bus or train. But no, it's a fantastic place, and they're, they're, I've got some, I've got some real personal favourites in Ireland. I really, really enjoy the place. And one of the reasons why we, we've included Ireland is because of the opening of the Wild Atlantic Way, which is a um, a, a long distance driving and, a, and indeed cycling route um, that, that people can take down the, down the west coast of Ireland. Um, what, what can people expect on that route, apart from a bit of rain every now and again? <laughs> Some fantastic views. You know, you're the Cliffs of Moher when you look out and all of the Atlantic Ocean is beating up against your feet. You know, that, that that's just a fantastic experience, and I, one of my we all, we all love Galway on the the west coast. But I remember I've, several times I've been to Ireland. I've been out to the Aran Islands, which are more or less off Galway, and they are just fantastic. They're as wild and as Irish as you could possibly ask for. And of course, Father Ted wasn't really filmed there, but it gives the impression that that's where Father Ted was based. <laughs> Father Ted tourism is a, is a whole uh, article in itself. I feel that is. Um, before we go any further, Sean, um, I wonder if you could just explain to, to anyone listening who's who's curious how indeed this list comes about. How does Only Planet decide its 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 ten countries for the year? Let's start uh, with you, I Sean. Think, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think, yeah. Well, generally we we work over a year in advance. We open up a list. Uh, a, short, a long list, I would say, to Lonely Planet staff, authors, and uh, the general public, and that list gets whittled down by a, a panel, in-house panel people. They vote on various factors such as, uh, I mean, is there anything ha special happening in destination, for example, uniqueness of the place, anything timely, uh, X factor is one of them. Uh, and we need obviously a broad spectrum of, of, of countries across around the world. So that's sort of where we start, and it gets refined along the way. Sounds like it's a, it's a good place to start. And it always throws up quite an eclectic mix. Um, number eight in our list this year um, is the, the Philippines. Um, Anna, I know that you've um, you've authored for Lonely Planet um, on the Philippines. To so, to me, when it, when I look at it, having not been there myself, it looks like just an endless number of possibilities, almost an impossible place to know where to start looking at the map of the Philippines. Where, 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 where would you start? How do you start planning a trip there? I think we've lost, I think we've lost Anna. Uh, yeah. Um, has anybody been to the Philippines, by the way? Yeah, well, I, I have. <laughs> You know, and, and you, as you Hello. say, where to start? There's so many islands. It's a, you know, it's not far from Indonesia, and Indonesia is also a place with a huge number of islands. And same story in the Philippines. You you can fly to other places apart from Manila, but Manila is a good place to start. There's it's a big city. It's got it's got lots of everything. But people soon want to go out somewhere else. They either want to head north up to the the rice terraces up in the north of the main island. Or out to one of the other islands, to Boracay or Cebu or 
there's a lot, a lot to do. And volcanoes. I mean, I've I've climbed the the Mayon volcano. Well, that's a that's a great experience. I think Anna's Anna's come back. So maybe we can ask her as well. I think Anna is here. Uh, sorry, John. Uh, the Boracay Islands. You know, it's it's sort of white sand, clear waters. I mean, it's, it's it, people have found out about the place, but. It's, it's one of the places to visit if you just want to get away from everything and just kick back on the beach. Um, Anna, how, how, um, how do you feel the Philippines lived up to this tag of being, sorry, and I, and I hate neologisms like this, but, but, but the new Thailand, do you, think, do you think that's an accurate description or is the Philippines a place in its own right? No, we don't have Anna. Can't hear you, Anna. Sorry about that. Um, if, if we'll try and come back to that question because we'll, we'll move on slightly from, uh, from the Philippines now. Um, Paul, I wonder when, when you look down um, this list of, uh, of ten destinations, if there's a, there's a particular one that you haven't been to that would, that would especially appeal to you. Um, and I'll just run through the ten again quickly. Singapore, Namibia, Lithuania, Ireland, Congo, Serbia, Philippines, St. Lucia. I won't mention Morocco because you know that well. Is there a particular one that jumps out at you for 2015? I, I think Nicaragua is, is one that really uh, quite fires my imagination. The last few years I, I've been tra traveling quite a bit in the in the general sort of Caribbean basin, but I've not really made it over to sort of Central America proper. Um, so as a, as, a, as a sort of teenager growing up, um, I was sort of quite politically involved, sort of found Nicaragua a really interesting um, area because of the politics that were happening there. So um, if you combine that with the, with the sort of the ecotourism uh, that seems to be playing out there, I think that looks like a really interesting destination for me. We've actually got a, got a question which has come in from a traveller which is asking about the emerging foodie scene in Nicaragua. Um, you know, is it, that, that seems to be something that's catching lots of people's eyes, lots of people's attention. Uh, anybody have a view on the, on the food there? Someone has to. Well, <laughs> someone has to have a view on the food in Nicaragua. No. Okay. Well, what we'll do is we will try and get an answer to that um, by uh, by uh, chatting to someone um, on Nicaragua afterwards. Anna, I'll um, I'll come back to you because I can see that you're there. Um, the question yes, that we had on the Philippines, the question we had in the Philippines was, is the Philippines the new Thailand, or is it a place in its own right? What do you think about that? Uh, it's definitely a place in its own right. Um, I think um, I, I was I was actually researching uh, the northern part of the Philippines a few weeks ago, um, and I was surprised at how much indigenous culture has survived intact, uh, particularly in the Cordillera, which is the mountain range in the middle of the island. Um, well, basically, the, the Spanish managed to conquer all of uh, Latin America and destroyed several major empires, being managed to conquer the Elaine from the Philippines, uh, which uh, which has a reputation for particularly fierce warriors who people who used to be headhunters and so on. Uh, while headhunting is no longer practiced, not really. I mean tribal skirmishes do break out. But uh, these are people who've managed to fend off missionaries and and um, um, and the Spanish, and and uh, keep their animus beliefs intact. Um, I mean, yes, there are some comparisons to be made with uh, with Thailand. Uh, the Philippines also has some amazing beaches, but I w I would actually argue that the Philippines has more places off the beaten track. Thailand has been well and truly explored, whereas in the Philippines there's um, there's considerably more scope for. Uh, persuading a fisherman to basically to drop you off on an uninhabited islet that you have all to yourself. Um, and there are also uh, a lot of unusual attractions as well. You have the, the chocolate hills, the, 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 the odd hillocks in the, on the island of Bohol. Um, you have the one of the new wonders of the world, the subterranean river on Palawan. Um, you have much more of a surfing scene in the Philippines than you in Thailand. Uh, particularly of, of Luzon, also of Siargao, um, and you have some incredible hiking opportunities as well. You have the rice terraces of the Cordillera, of course, which is which is probably the biggest hiking destination in in the Philippines. But you also have the the volcanoes on Mindoro, Mindanao, uh, on Negros Island as well. So there's there's plenty of scope for that also. Um, 
I suppose the only bit which kind of lets the side down is the food. The, the Philippines is not terribly well known for its cuisine. Uh, but as I've discovered, there are there are p parts of the country where I would definitely recommend going for the food alone, such as the uh, Bicol, the, the southern part of Luzon Island, where they use a lot of kind of um, coconut cream and chilies in their cooking. Um, or, for example, the far-flung Batanes Islands, which are off like way to the north of the Philippines, closer to Taiwan than the rest of the uh, the country, where they use some really unusual foodstuffs, shall we say. Uh, so yes, the Philippines is very much a country in its own right. Hmm. Good stuff. Um, we're running slightly low on, on time, um, but uh, I do just want to try and cover a couple of other questions before I go. Um, returning to, to Singapore, Sean, what day trips would you recommend for a traveller there wanting to see another side of the place to get out? The oh, well, there are a couple of islands off Singapore, so um, Pulau Ubin is one of them. It's in the sort of uh, southeastern side. You can get on this rickety bum boat off Changi uh, Village. There's a little uh, dock there and you go across. It's a short ride across. And it's this little island that's sort of stuck in time, it's sort of 1960s Singapore with like tin in tin roof shacks and get a bicycle and cycle around. There are old temples, um, an old quarry, lots to see, seafood restaurants, mangrove uh, boardwalks. So that's, that's a different side of Singapore to see. That sounds like, it sounds like a good suggestion. And um, one last question that we'll do is um, anything else, Tony, I guess this would be one for you, and anything else to do in Congo besides ecotourism, besides looking for these 100,000 gorillas? What else, what else would you recommend there? I, I, would, I would sit at a bar in Brazzaville and look across at the other Congo. And I, you know, in both Congos, the, the, the French were in the um, Congo Republic and the Belgians were in the, um, the Belgian Congo, what well, used to be the Belgian Congo once upon a time. And they, they left um, you know, a taste for their food. You can get good steak and frites in either, in either Congo and the beer isn't bad and the wine seems to have made its way there from France. It's, it's not, a, not a bad place for eating. We've been, we've been you know, dissing the food of the Philippines. Well, try the food of the Congo. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, the other things doing the Congo. And, and, and listen to some great Congolese music. Oh, absolutely, yeah. The music is fantastic. You're, you're absolutely right there. You know, in both Congos, in, Brazil, in Congo Brazzaville and Congo Democratic Republic, the, the music is terrific. Did you see the sappers when you were there? I, you know, I, I didn't see many sappers. They, these are these wonderfully dressed men. There's a great sort of coffee table book of the, um, the fashions of um, Congo Brazzaville. And um, if, if you do, you know, find the right place. And I went looking for them, but I was a bit disappointed not to come across them. They, they really take fashion to me. They've got great colors. They've got great style. It's uh, a... It's, uh, a nice extravagant part of Congo Republic. Um, I've just had a just had a note from um, from Lorna Parks, who is Lonely Planet's editor for um, for the Congo uh, for Nicaragua, not for the Congo, um, and she's just sent me a few notes um, about Nicaragua um, and uh, its food, mentioning um, fantastic local produce, organic produce, craft beer. Great coffee, and noting that Granada is a hotbed for experimental chefs. So, uh, thanks very much, Lorna. It's great to great to get that in there. Um, by the way, if you're interested in the sapper chat about these dapper Congolese gentlemen, we'll be uploading a video to the Lonely Planet YouTube channel about the sappers next week, this week, later this week. So, uh, so look out for that. Um, we're going to have to leave it there. Um, as ever, we could sit around and chat about these places for a very long time, and um, actually I'd much rather go and visit some of them, but there you go. Um, so we're going to say um, thank you very much to everybody, to Anna, Paul, Rory, Sean, and Tony, um, and we'll look forward to another Hangout on Air soon, and um, do keep an eye on the page for any other updates. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks, guys. Good.